Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Justin Tranter, executive music producer and songwriter for Grease, Rise of the Pink Ladies, a brand new Grease prequel series that premiered on Paramount Plus in April. Justin, never before has anyone created more original music for a single season of television. 30 songs. How did you cram that in? That's pretty incredible. <laughs> it um, was the hardest uh, and most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life. It's you know, the, it was sure it was a lot of time, but I'm, I'm used to writing a lot of songs. I, I kind of overwrite anyway in my normal pop life. I just like to write a lot. And then like the ones that feel really special, go back and tweak those and make those amazing. But so I was used to the quantity, but um, I was not used to the, no one's done this before. So like us figuring out logistics of when something gets delivered to the choreographer, but it has to be approved by 43 executives, but the choreographer is like, you know, teaching the cast based on demos and the demos are gonna, you know, that that level of logistics was um, really intense. And um, me and the showrunner, Annabelle Oaks, uh, who it was her, brilliant mind that found a way back into the universe of Greece that I was excited about being a part of. Her and I had to just like lock arms and be like, all right, we just decide how this goes down. Cause no one's done, no one can give us advice. No one's, you know, Glee is the only thing that's close to this amount of music, but though they were covers. So it's just, a, you can, you kind of know what the song is already. This is, these are originals and so yeah, it was, I wish I had a better, more concise answer for you, but it, it's sort of the process of achieving this amount of original music changed every week until like the last three episodes, then we kind of like had our structure down. But up until then, it was just like a magical uh, free for all of how the fuck do we pull this off? <laughs> and you're kind of combining this 50s style era with the modern flair. I mean, how do you keep that relevant with today's audience? Yeah, so it was, we, we, we looked at the mothership of the Grease movie as our sort of blueprint, which is, that is very much a late 70s version of the 50s. So, um, uh, you know, more so than, than uh, you know, some songs are way more 50s and some songs are way more 70s and some songs are somewhere in the middle. So we, we, we used that as our blueprint of like, all right, some songs can feel straight up 50s. Some songs can feel like a, a nice mix of 50s with like maybe some modern low end or a modern snare sound, just touches of modern. Or they can be full on 50s, but the melodic rhythms, what the singer is singing is a little more. There's a song called World Without Boys, World Without Boys. Um, that's like a total like, you know, 50s doo-wop girl group song. But then the, the rhythms vocally are a little quicker or um, just finding little moments to, to so that young people can watch this show and feel like it belongs to them while still being nostalgic, you know, like the... The, I think to me, you know, Greece, the original Greece is much more about 50s nostalgia and commenting on the 50s, how it was not as perfect as everyone seems. It's much more about the nostalgia than it is about being like a perfect period piece. So we use that blueprint to sort of set us free. Talk a little bit about the talent on the show. You've worked with a lot of major artists. These are mostly new up and comers. What was yeah. it like to, to see them and watch them bring your music to life. I mean, it was so fucking cool. You know, it, it's, you know, even the singers um, like Ari who plays Cynthia is, you know, one of the best singers I've ever worked with in my life. They had never been in a studio before, you know? So even though, you know, they went to a great musical theater school and they were in Pat Benatar's musical, you know, they, they, they are a professional performer, young, but a professional performer. It's a very different art form than being in on a microphone that's this close to you and can capture every single detail. Um, but they all stepped up to the plate, you know, and they, um, no matter what level of singing they were at, they all worked with a vocal coach that I love named Chloe Pappas. Um, so, cause even the ones that have been singing forever and like were killing it, 
singing on a mic is a different technique. So had them working with a vocal coach that I trust to sort of prepare them for what happens in the studio and for, for each single song they sang, even if they had two lines in a song, Chloe was working with them before they got to the studio because the schedule again is just so nuts that we just had to make sure everything was, was beyond prepped. So to watch these fresh talents um, step up to the plate at every turn and also to learn with them, you know, like Marissa who plays Jane, um, great singer, uh, but we got really lucky uh, that the song I Want More, which is in episode two, we actually wrote last. Um, the whole show was written and almost done shooting. And we realized that episode two just felt a little too slow with only two songs. And the songs were at the beginning, one at the beginning, one at the end. So we kind of lost the, the rhythm of a musical. And so I was able to go and pick a spot. Annabelle said, watch episode two, because it was basically done besides special effects and stuff. Watch episode two and pick where you want a song and got to pick a spot and um, got to write a traditional I want song, which is so important for musical theater. Um, so was so grateful to do that. But at this point, I've been listening to Marissa sing for like seven months. So I knew exactly how to make this new superstar sound like the superstar they deserve to, you know? So not only did I get to write possibly my favorite song in the show at the very end, but I was able to have the context of the story and the context of this voice um, to make it all as, as good as it can be. So you're really working with these kids. It was seven months, you know, seven months on set um, to get them to be the, the best that they, that they, to get us to make that, you know, like for us to meet them where they are was really, really cool journey. And she really sang that song. I, I spoke to I her. Mean, and she told me she actually had like a cracked or like a misplaced rib or something. And they were trying to like float her around in that scene. And she's like, can we not do so much flying? I didn't know that. Holy fuck. I mean, yeah, these musicals are hard. I mean, <laughs> it, is, it is, you know, I'm doing a stage musical that I've been creating and working on with Adina Menzel and Eve Ensler um, and Diane Paulus for a couple years. And, I think stage musicals are the hardest art form of all time. Um, but I think TV musicals are a, a pretty serious second because the just the logistical hurdles and having to find the subtleties to get the audience to to follow you on a journey where people just start singing and what these actors have to, to go through with the fucking acrobatics and the dancing and the singing and acting it was just insane it's really insane another song that's having a big moment in pop culture right now is crushing me it's a like this queer love anthem and it's becoming an internet sensation what was the inspiration behind that song? And what's that been like to see this explode now? Okay, so what I love so much about this song, blowing the fuck up on the internet, is like three, five different points. The one is uh, at the premiere, um, you know, one of the big executive producers on the show said, what songs do you think are really gonna connect? And I was like, I can tell you, if this was five years ago, I could just 100% tell you what the answer to that is. It was going to be, I want more. It's going to be new cool. Uh, those are, those are going to be our, our two big wins. Those are the songs, trust me. Yeah. But uh, in the same sentence, I said, but we don't live, this is not five years ago. We live in a TikTok world. We have no fucking clue what people are going to decide is the moment and we have no clue what little clip someone's gonna rip from our show and somehow that's gonna be what happens. So up until a week and a half ago, I was right. It was, I want more was our most listened to and new cool was our second most listened to. Like that was, <clears throat> it was it. Um, and then we finally had our TikTok moment that I was praying for um, and kind of knew was gonna happen. And it was just this 30 seconds of crushing me and you know it's also funny for the emmy campaign and everything you know we have to pick what songs we're submitting so we submitted i want more and new cool and i said like 
when are, I've never been, I've never been through this process before. You know, I, I did a song that was nominated for a Golden Globe, but I wasn't a part of, I was earlier in my career. No one asked me what I thought about anything. <laughs> so I, I just, it just happened. I had no idea that anyone, I didn't know what campaigning, I didn't know anything. So I was like, any way we can wait until the season is done to see what kids decide is their favorite or what, what not even kids. I, I always, I'm from pop music, so I always think kids, but what the audience decides is their favorite. And they're like, oh no, the way the scheduling works, like we have to get this shit submitted now. So picked, I want more and new cool and, but new, I knew this moment was gonna happen. And what I think is so beautiful is it's 30 seconds of Ari, uh, Cin you know, the, who plays Cynthia, Cynthia, our queer character, um, in 1954, and there were queer people in 1954, I'm sorry to say everybody, um, but um, finally coming to grips with the fact that like they have a serious crush on a woman and it is 1954 and that is terrifying. And it seems like the character is about to, you know, in this, in this 30 second clip on TikTok, you feel like, okay, this character is like going for it. You know, I've got to like, I've got to get over this and step right up and use my lips and just be honest about my feelings. And so to see, you know, when we're in an era when, um, you know, I work on many different things and I've taken many shows out and taken many shows out with queer leads and they never get picked up. It's like, we love queer characters. Can they be fifth on the call sheet? Can they be sixth? Can they be fourth? Please not one. Um, and to see this moment um of this queer love and this queer longing um just take over the fucking internet is so cool and um to look at you know for a tv musical to have a song that is on the big on the internet playlist on spotify it is on teen beats on spotify these are huge playlists that every major record label is is fighting to get their new not even their new their 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 pop art their established superstars on these playlists to see a queer rockabilly love song um take over these play be on these playlists is really fucking cool for me and also i wrote the song over Zoom because a major pop star who shall remain nameless gave me COVID. So I couldn't go oh, into the studio, but we had to write a song like in these three days because they were gonna shoot it the three days after this. And so we had to write it, record it. So because they need to lip sync to their final vocal so that it everything matches, you know? So wrote this rockabilly queer love longing anthem on zoom with covid like a year ago right now like a, to this week a year ago um and to see the internet fall in love with it is just that was a very long-winded answer but i'm very excited about it so there you go there's my long it's just just in time for for pride month i mean how cool rockabilly musical theater lesbian rockabilly for pride month come on let's go yeah. I want to get a little personal here. You were dropped by four record labels before your incredible success. And now you've written and collaborated on songs that have sold over 50 million copies. Two Diamond certified hits with Sorry by Justin Bieber and Believer by Imagine Dragons. 50 billion streams or something like that. What kept that drive alive for you? And what do you say to people who like keep having doors closed in their face? Um, I... First of all, thank you for I love I love when people read my stats because after <laughs> after, after so much failure, <laughs> it never gets old hearing about that. Um, and as one of the very few openly queer people in the music business, um, you know I I don't know the stats on how many queer people work in TV, but in music it's fucking terrifying. Um, <laughs> so. Um, I am always proud of hearing those stats. So, so thank you. Thank you for the quick bio shout out. Um, I say to people who are maybe thinking about quitting, um, do you, do you believe in yourself? Like deeply, 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 because, um, I did and I do. And, um, so that belief in myself, I know that sounds fucking cheesy, but like my belief in myself, which is like, these people are wrong. They don't get it. You know, when it came to my band, I would, 
our, our fan base was not massive, but it was passionate and mighty. And I would look out to these kids who I, and I meant so much to them. And I was like, I, I can't quit. And maybe I need to quit the band. Maybe I need to like, just realize that I was 33 when I, when I pulled the plug on the band and my band members were all following me on this very queer vision, even though they were all straight and I love them to death and still work with all of them on in different capacities and still am close with all of them. And I just was like, I got to find some way to win in this business. And it wasn't even about the business. I just, I want to make music the world hears. And if that means that I am not going to sing it, then fuck it. I'm not going to sing it. Um, so to people who want to make art as a living, whatever field you are in, if you truly think that is what you're meant to do, you're probably right. And I was never the most talented person as a, as a, like when I was in arts high school, which was saved my life. And I'm so grateful for, I was never the best at school, but I was the most determined. <laughs> I was delusional. I was convinced I was destined for greatness. Um, so I think like embrace that delusion and also don't be afraid that if your if your dream changes a little bit, like I wanted to be famous so bad or so I thought. And then once I had my first hit, just in 2014, had my first hit, I was like, ah, I didn't want to be famous. I just wanted people to hear my ideas. I wanted as many people as possible to hear my ideas. Let these fuckers go be famous because it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> um, so be delusional and, and, and uh, fucking stick to your guns and don't give up and don't be afraid to let your dream slightly change because at the core of it, your dream has to be able to make art. That has to be the dream. If your dream is fame, be an influencer, because that's hard as fuck. Being an influencer is fucking hard. I've been trying to make TikToks and promote for Pink Ladies. I have a guest starring role in Pink Ladies. So I'm promoting more than I've ever promoted any pop song. This shit is hard. This shit is exhausting. So no shade to influencers, that's not easy. But if you want to be famous, don't focus on art. Just focus on fame, you know? Yeah. Who who was your favorite artist growing up? Who was your major influence? I mean, the person that like, there was many. It was it was Courtney Love, Tori Amos, Ani DeFranco, Patty Griffin, um, Gwen Stefani. Um, you know, there was it was just the women of the '90s, the fucking badasses of the '90s. Um, but I would say. If there, if I had to pick one, because your question was one, I would say Ani DeFranco. Um, just uh, her, like being the the queen of her own compost heap. That's a lyric of hers. I'm not calling her career a compost heap. That's a lyric. Um, <laughs> being the queen of her own compost heap. Um, you know, building an empire out of car tires and chicken wire. Again, all lyrics of hers. Um, that was so inspiring to me. Like this person, um, proudly bisexual with a shaved head in the nineties, just like, like paving her own path and just kicking all the ass. That was very inspiring to me. Um, and I look at myself now as a songwriter who owns my own label and, oh, hi dog, um, who owns my own label and, um, tries to do the right thing every chance I can get in, in, in not just politics and in fundraising, but also in my businesses, tries to be as ethical as I can. Um, Ani, I think, is the person that like set me on that path. Well, you're setting people on their path now. You're such an inspiration to so many. I could talk to you about music and this TV show all day, but we ran out of time. So incredible work that you've done. Thank you. An amazing feat to create all of these songs for Rise of the Pink Ladies. Congratulations on the show, all of your success throughout your career and best of luck to you and the on the upcoming Emmy nominations and the, the whole show. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. 